Without further ado, we're going to begin with the introduction of today's speaker. Our topic today is Formula Student Aerodynamics Speed Hack or Horsepower Hog with Saidat Ramesh from Team Skillshark EduTech. During this webinar, Saidat will give an insight into some baseline me methodologies teams can adopt to decide whether their aero kits are worth the extra cost. He hopes to provide an insight into what aero can potentially do for an FS vehicle and to help newer teams learn about the basics of aero while helping more experienced teams reconsider the use of these devices in their cars. So today's session may be between an, uh, maybe an hour long, followed by Q&A. Uh, for those who don't know much about Saidat, Saidat uh, is a BTEC graduate from SRM University in Chennai. And during his studies, he was a part of the camera racing team as an aero engineer and also as a competition driver. After he graduated, Saidat pursued an MSc in motorsports engineering offered by the Oxford Brookes University in the UK. And he completed his final year thesis with a focus on advanced vehicle dynamics and lap time simulation and also race engineering. So today, Saidat currently works as a motorsport content developer with Skillshark EduTech, and he also assists in race engineering uh, for international esports events. So without further ado, please let me welcome Saidat uh, to the main forum. Saidat, you may go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Kathy, for that introduction. Uh, uh, very, very excited to be here today. Um, and uh, as, as you can all see, the topic today is going to be about aerodynamics. Um, yeah, just to add on a little bit about me. Um, so I, I, I've had the privilege of being part of uh, Formula Student events for a bit between uh, three different teams over the past five years. Um, so it's given me a lot of uh, insight to, to the different sort of mistakes and uh, pitfalls that uh, that that are you know laid out when it comes to formula student uh, aerodynamics uh, so hopefully uh, this gives you a bit of uh, insight to what uh what actually you need to look out for. Um, now, I know, uh, like, I, I spent, uh, you know, a lot of my time being an aerodynamicist uh, in, in the team. But, uh, you know, in addition to that, I also did, uh, you know, I worked in business plan. And my, my thesis was focused more on race engineering. So, um, I'm just telling you straight off the bat, uh, you know, take what take what I say with a pinch of salt. Uh, because I, I, I have the same amount of experience that most of you do in, in terms of a lot of uh, aerodynamics in formula student cars. I don't claim to be an expert, uh, but I really hope that what I explained today, uh, these are all things from my understanding, my learnings, and I hope this is helpful for teams who are, uh, you know, potentially uh, getting involved in aerodynamics and starting to put aero kits on the car. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, yeah. So uh, we work out uh, quite a few topics today. Um, you know, it's it's going to have some basics, of course, things like basic fluid dynamics, a little bit of vehicle dynamics, uh, and the basics of how uh, different aero aero uh, elements work. So that for the benefit of newer teams, uh, you know, if if you haven't uh, started doing research on these topics or you're not very comfortable with uh, these topics, uh, this could give you a little bit of a head start. Uh, but I would still strongly recommend you do a lot of reading work after this presentation. Um, so, uh, you know, first we'll start off with uh, fluid dynamics, go through some of the basics, um, the bare minimum that you need to know to, uh, to understand how uh, fluid flows around different objects. Um, after that, we'll cover a little bit about arrow and BD. Um, not really a little bit, there's quite a lot to talk about here. So this kind of is a very crucial part of this presentation because it will tell you how you can actually use those forces to understand what's happening to your car. Um, after that, I'll cover you know different aero devices that are commonly uh, seen in cars, and uh, I'll give you a small example of a, of, of a particular racing series that will help you visualize what air is actually doing to a car. Um, after this, uh, we'll go through uh, conceptualization and design, uh, trying to understand how you can start your aero concept. And I'll, I'll tell, I'll give you some tips on how you can go about the process to start off with. Um, and after that, we'll go a little bit over simulation, not too much, uh, just the basics of uh, what you can look out for in CFT. And we'll end it with some validation uh, techniques that you can use and how you can actually optimize your performance uh, and prepare yourselves better for the next few competitions or any competition you're going to attend in your current FS season. Um, so with that, let's go to the first topic. So let's start off with uh, the basics. What is aerodynamics? Um, it's the dynamics of airflow as the name itself suggests. So it's basically understanding how your air moves around an object. It's a dynamic flow of air. Uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of uh, a lot of simulation for aerodynamics is done in static or quasi-static state. Um, but the, the principle is to understand how things are moving. And uh, to understand what aerodynamics is, you need to understand fluid dynamics because after all, fluid dynamics is a superset for aerodynamics. 
fluids uh, range from anything between la glass, uh, uh, gases and, and liquids. Uh, although in, in aerodynamics, you're only looking at gases, it's important to understand the basics of fluid dynamics. Um, so let's let's consider you know a plate in, in free flow, right? Um, let's say it's moving, or rather, let's not consider in free flow. Let's just say the air is static. You have a plate and it's moving with a velocity uh, v. Um, now, you're going to have two different forces predominantly two different forces acting on it. Uh, we'll get to a third force later on, but firstly, you'll be having drag, which is something you'll always face when you're moving in air. Then you have down force, which is a downwards force. Uh, so it's basically whatever force is acting on the plate is resolved into these two components um, of force. Now, let's try to understand how that's happening. So let's let's assume now that the plate is static. We're taking it from the reference uh, of, of the plate. Um, so now you have a, a set of particles in a vertical line. They're moving closer to the plate. And just observe as it gets to the plate, you already see particles that reach the edge of that plate get deflected downwards. Um, now, generally, in, in, in a smooth uh, surface, fluids tend to stick to those surfaces. Okay, that's just a property of the fluids. Um, has a little bit to do with surface tension. Something you need to look into to fully understand that is Reynolds number and turbulence. Uh, but for now, let's just see this particle gets deflected downwards. And then sequentially, as the flow goes onto the plate, the individual particles start bouncing off. Now, these aren't the only particles. There are particles like right next to each, I mean, next to this line, they're all atomic. But, uh, you know, right now, just for visualization, all of them sequentially collide and push the particles above them upwards, right? And what happens is they all get deflected. And of course, particles down here also get pushed down by this particle, uh, which, is, which is present over here. Uh, Anyhow, what happens because of all of this is you have an effective uh, deflection and, and, and because of uh, simple uh, simple laws of mechanics, uh, you're going to be getting a force. And that's that's what this force is. And then it gets resolved into these two components of force. Now, if that force is perpendicular to the plate and the plate is at 45 degrees, you're going to have equal, uh, you know, you're going to have an equal split of drag and down force. Um, and that's basically Newton's laws. Uh, now, another way to visualize this and uh, trust me, this is a more holistic way of looking at it. Um, I'll tell you later why it is, uh, but it's to look at it in terms of pressure, okay? I mean, you talk about pressure, um, don't just think of it as some static force that's pressing on your plate. Um, it's, it's not as simple as that, uh, and it's, it's better not to look at it that way. Think of pressure in terms of energies, and that's exactly what Bernoulli's equation does. Um, it takes uh, basically your uh, three, uh, so it's, it's split into heads. So it's potential head, your kinetic head, and then your uh, gravitational head. And that's essentially what that is, is conservation of energy. So if you take any any law of physics, any sort of law that you're looking at in, in, in mechanics, it all comes back to conservation of energy because that is literally what binds everything. Um, so it's better to look at things in Bernoulli's principle. So you know, if you've learned fluids, I'm pretty sure you've already know these, but if you haven't, then these are some topics you have to look into uh, before going any further in, in, in starting your design. Anyhow, let's look at those two forces we were talking about. Downforce, now that's the benefit. Everyone talks about downforce, but what exactly is downforce doing to your car? Let's say you have a, you have a car over here, a red bullets going through this corner. Um, and let's say at that specific point, this is the radius with respect to, you know, the distance of the CG to the instantaneous center of your, of your corner. Um, so this is, this is the, the corner that's falling and uh, this is the radius R. Okay. Uh, now, of course, because of the tire forces, first, you're going to have an inertial force outwards, right? And then that's being balanced by the tire forces that, that go inwards. So you have the reaction force and then you have that uh, the inertial force outwards. Uh, now, when you equate both these in, in equilibrium, of course, um, you basically get uh, uh, this is lateral lateral force is basically m mv square on. Um, and understand one thing: you're talking about static friction. You're not looking at dynamic. Uh, you're not looking at uh, kinetic friction here. It's static, which means that uh, there's no relative movement laterally between the tires and the road. And this is the first thing you need to understand about aerodynamics. It's dependent on the vertical load. So, you know, you see here, uh, uh, static friction is basically. Uh, well, more most terms is proportional to the the the, um, uh, the the normal force, which means that you know static friction has to be constant, which it's not. I'll get to that later. But essentially, your static friction, static uh, tire reaction is equal to the inertial force, which means that increasing the normal force will increase that limit of static friction, which means you can go, you can have a higher lateral force before the car starts sliding. And if you have a higher lateral force, that means that you can go at a higher velocity, considering that the mass of your vehicle and the corner radius is still the same, which for the most part it is in, in, in a span of a few laps. So ultimately what you need to understand is more down force uh, means that you have more normal force, which means that ultimately you can go faster in a corner. Now, 
in theory it's as simple as this but in reality it's not um because of down force you also have something called drag like we've seen it's the other component of force that gets resolved um now the downside to drag is of course it's acting uh, you know it's it's acting uh, opposite to the direction of motion of your car um so uh, one thing to understand is drag and down force um, are, are directly are uh, proportional to the square of velocity so if you double your velocity your drag and down force will quadruple in simplistic terms um so let's say this is the so these are the curves um so it's based off a quadratic equation so these are these are these are two parabolas basically um so the green is the down force and then the red is the drag okay uh, now you only have so much engine power and that too because you're, if you're running a combustion vehicle uh, you're not always going to have that maximum power it's going to build up so um what do you what do you have to do is as you slowly build up you start going faster and faster you have a force that go that pushes the car in front um because of, of of the traction force uh, from the tires and you reach a point where you can't overcome that drag force see this is the problem with drag the faster you go the more drag you get so the faster you go the more power you need to go faster uh, so it, it it's it's sort of a paradox uh, but you reach a point where you can no longer go any faster and that is what you call terminal velocity now we we've, we've learned about terminal velocity in in uh, i believe fluid dynamics in 11th standard where where if you drop a drop a ball you know it ultimately reaches a point where the viscous forces uh, is equal to uh, the uh, the 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 weight of the ball um that that's where you get the terminal velocity and i'm not mistaken that's uh, stokes law uh, where you get that equation but yeah that is what terminal velocity is so surprisingly now or unsurprisingly you have that same sort of uh, problem that you'll face when you know you're accelerating a vehicle straight on on your road um so this is the downside you will reach a point where your car can no longer max out otherwise otherwise in in theory if you keep accelerating if you keep pressing the throttle and your engine is doing all of the work and producing that energy uh you should be able to accelerate to infinity right so i mean in theory you should be because that's what uh, newton's laws dictate if you don't have a reaction force unfortunately this is what that reaction force is when you're playing with air um so yeah this this is one big downside which is drag and uh, again I'm, i'm sorry if this is all basic stuff this is elementary but i just thought it's good to cover it um let's get to more complex stuff now uh so where do you start why do you, we we established you need aero for down force uh and we've established that there is another parasite which is drag but but where do you start the whole process what are your priorities um in aerodynamic design let's go through them one add down force that is a uh, top priority don't look at an aero kit if uh, you're not adding down force because there's really nothing else you should be focusing on as top priority there's no other reason to throw it on because everything else that comes with it is is is, is more of a of of a of a secondary issue or repercussion that you need to deal with um so firstly it adds down force secondly um it will uh, decrease drag so you need to make sure that your goal is to decrease the drag that comes and if you're really smart with the way in which you design your surfaces or design the shapes that you use uh you know a good aerodynamicist will be able to add more down force while decreasing drag and if at all you're getting drag you should be smart enough to use it in a way that it will help you again something we'll get into when we talk about uh, vd later on in in this chapter um then of course it's to optimize vehicle load balance so i've put it at number 3 but i think it's almost just as important as the first two so these three kind of go hand in hand the vehicle load balance uh, or the aero balance in this case is dependent on the amount of down force drag and the location of both these forces on the car so after this um of course after that you need to look at uh, enhancing component cooling okay so when you're playing around with air for everyone who's using not only combustion vehicles even if you're using an electric vehicle you need to keep those motors cool um so of course uh, in 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 electric motors you do have uh, you know liquid flowing water cooled but uh, the, the, there's no harm in sending some air that you're that you're uh, you know dis dislodging into the right side um so of course component cooling is also extremely important if you're using an aero package it's important if you're not it's it's a little bit more important than this and i'll show you that in a minute um and then of course optimizing the engine intake um It's, it is not a really big issue especially not at maybe the uh, the, the speeds that we're running in formula student i i'm pretty sure someone who's uh, who's more uh, proficient in the in, in the powertrain side will 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 have a better in, input on this uh, but uh, generally as long as you keep it in clear flow you should be fine um, the most uh, most teams you see uh, the restrictor and then the uh, air filter somewhere at the c cabin you know either sticking out between the roll hoop and the driver's helmet or somewhere on the side uh, but in any any case you want to put it in free flow just so that you you use least amount of there's a least amount of uh, resistance to kind of suck that air into the engine 
So these are the five goals. And of course, there are other factors that are important. These are the only ones I've mentioned here because they're directly involved in aero. But then you have a lot of other things like your springs and dampers and all those things come into play later on. But right now, in terms of design, you really want to look at these five. Um, now, what I've put is a graph over here. So um, yeah, here you have uh, uh, two sides to this graph. On this side, on the positive y-axis, we'll talk about your priorities when you have an aero package. And uh, on the bottom, it's priorities, aero related priorities when you don't have an aero package. So it's important to understand even if you don't have an aero package, you're still going to have to deal with aerodynamics. There's no way to work around that. Um, but anyhow, uh, another thing just to keep in mind is the scaling on the positive y and negative y are not the same when I'm going to show you. So just because something is up here and something is down here at the same distance doesn't mean they have the same priority level. Um, so first, uh, number one is, is, the, is the downforce over here, right? Number one, yes, when you are dealing with an aero package, that's your top priority. And it's the most independent, uh, especially if you're looking at something like your front wing. Since it's your top priority, that should be your, it should be the most independent factor. Everything else that you deal with should be kind of a, an, an issue that, that, that comes along with the, generating that downforce. Um, then you have decreasing drag which is again, a top priority, but it's a dependent factor because drag comes because of downforce. That's why I put it on this side. Okay. Then you have three, which is optimizing vehicle load balance. Again, very important, uh, but it's also a dependent factor. And in fact, it depends on both downforce and drag. Then you have uh, component cooling. Uh, again, highly dependent factor depends on everything else, but since it's not top priority, it's placed on this end of the spectrum. And then you have optimizing your engine intake, which is you know, slightly dependent. I haven't put it as max dependency because there is a way to kind of put it out of the way of all that airflow that you're, you're, you're generating. Uh, and it's not really a top priority, but it's good to keep that in mind. So of course, downforce has a direct effect on drag. Drag and both of them in turn have an effect on uh, vehicle load balance. Then you've got downforce uh, affecting component cooling because based on how you generate, uh, how you design your wings, you're gonna, wings and body works, you're gonna affect cooling. And of course, that also, uh, because of all of that, you're also going to have to slightly tweak stuff to make sure your engine is working well. So this is if you have an aero kit. But if you don't have an aero kit, again, downforce is still independent, yep, to an extent. Uh, it's not very important. It's not top priority. But there are still ways you can generate downforce without really putting big components or kits on your car. Um, then you have drag, which is, again, just as important as in the previous case. Um, it's very important. Always reduce drag. That's 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 rule number one, because that's like the, the biggest factor. That's as 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 long as you go faster, it's always going to become more important to deal with that. So that's why it's still there. Uh, optimizing vehicle load balance. You don't have too much control if you're not putting too many uh, wing elements. In fact, the only thing you can really play around with is your ride height at that point. Uh, so that lies over here. Component cooling again. Um, it's important, slightly more priority now for that uh, uh, than, than uh, in, in the previous case relative to drag because it's, it's something that you really have to focus on. It's your top priority now that you're not focusing on downforce anymore. Um, and then you have uh, optimizing engine intake, which is kind of uh, you know a, a side uh, thing that, that, that gets uh, solved on its own more often than not. If you don't have kits, it's quite simple to position your filter so that you get uh, enough air into the engine. Um, so yeah, these are all the things. Of course, uh, these are the dependencies, uh, very similar to the previous cases. Uh, again, you're just playing around with airflow. Um, you know, feel free to watch this back later on and have a look at this. Again, this is qualitative and, and based on uh, what I've understood. It's not something that's written in stone. Uh, so it's just my take on how you could perhaps uh, go about these processes. Anyhow, with that, let's go on to the, the, the next part. So let's go to the basics again. Okay, a quick uh, VD lesson just to just to get stuff rolling okay you have a car it's a bicycle model for those who don't know this is a is a it's a good way to analyze your your uh, vehicle steering and your performance um because you're not really dealing with the roller pitch um so yeah these are just uh, you know your, your, those are the heading velocities that you have a certain slip angle in both the front and rear tires when you extend those lines perpendicular to the direction of movement of those tires you have your instantaneous center where they intersect and you join that to the center of gravity of the vehicle and draw a line perpendicular to that line through the CG. Um, and then you have all these parameters over here, uh, angles, omega, and then this, uh, the angle of, of, of that uh, vehicle CG direction with respect to the center line of the vehicle, that is what you call beta, uh, the slip angle, vehicle slip angle. And of all the things you're looking at as an aerodynamicist, slip angles are probably the only real thing you need to 
really really focus on uh, as 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 a as a core uh, part of the your performance and especially beta and i'll show you this when we get to uh, you know get to a couple of chapters down the line but it's very important to understand what the slip angle does um yeah so uh, from that you have these uh, basically geometrically you can take these uh, vectors and find these angles um, feel free to go back and watch these again uh, so a neutral steer that what that means is you're having equal forces on the front and rear and and uh, let, let's just assume in this case uh, center of gravity your mechanical balance when you're taking that corner is is 50 50 front and rear uh, just to keep things simple um, so in this case of course uh, you're going to have neutral steer which means the front and rear uh, tires are balancing each other out slip angle wise um in understeer what happens is that beta angle that you see we saw it in the previous slide that beta angle is is uh, is is bigger so that means that it, it faces inwards i'm sorry if i'm getting my sign convention is wrong but just relative to that figure if beta increases that means the 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 slip is going inwards um what that means is the center of the vehicle is is going you know it's it's going at an angle that's uh, that's trying to push the vehicle center into the corner or that basically does is pushes the front uh, you know the front of the tires the, the front tires outwards and that's why you get uh, understeer um that's one way to look at it uh but it's it's important for you to look at it that way as an aerodynamicist now because of that you know you need to put a, a little bit more steering input to counter for that and get a little bit more steering involved to go around the corner without running off that's why uh, your front is going to saturate quicker than your rear it's having to do more work and then uh, ultimately it saturates uh, in this case of course your cg would perhaps be slightly more front biased then you have the final case which is oversteer um it's the opposite of understeer your beta is in the other direction so it points left in, fa in fact it points out of the outer the corner and what that means is the center of your vehicle is is pushing outwards so it's trying to overtake the front from the left side that's basically spinning your vehicle out because your your rear your rear tire is yawing you know it's it's moving more towards the left side and increasing the yaw rate so you're steering more than you want and because of that you need to reduce the steering input to get a uh, optimal vehicle performance uh, or get a neutral steering performance um so yeah this is just basic uh, layout of vehicle dynamics uh, keep these in mind because they will be useful in the coming slides um so now yeah so what let's let's go back to that uh, the thing we're talking about which is downforce um now you see here these are different load graphs and as you can see so this is 900 pounds this is 1800 pounds um so yeah the, these are these are pretty high loads um as you can see as you increase the the vertical force that's acting on your tires um the the maximum lateral force you can attain before reaching the peak and and, and sliding is uh, is a lot more before you saturate your tires um, that's why you see the line of peaks going this way so naturally what that would say uh, is is as you increase the loads this this peak will keep you know going going up but you can also see that it's curving so there is a point where it no longer will keep uh, increasing so what this shows is you can just keep adding down force because at some point it's not going to be as effective as what you think um yeah and to explain that better we have this uh, this diagram over here so of course the the reward is getting a uh, higher slip angles as you can see from this uh, you you're you're getting uh, you know more load and also you know slightly higher slip angles you're able to attain or rather another way to look at it is for the same slip angle you're getting more lateral force um, generally more often than not uh, your slip angle limit is not going to increase too much unless you do something like you soften your tires or 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 maybe you use uh, you know thinner tires uh, but in 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 most cases you're not going to gain too much in terms of maximum slip angle what you're actually gaining is 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 in terms of cornering stiffness because you're getting more load you're getting more lateral force for a given slip angle uh, but there is something that happens in tires and it's because it's tires are physiochemical uh, i mean you know there is a, there is a chemical bond that's also happening and it's also physical uh, with the road um, so you know the catch of course is there's something called tire load sensitivity now we see this lateral force coefficient which is fy which is the lateral force uh, over the vertical force and we've also seen that lateral force is equal to vertical load uh, times mu so this is kind of in a way you know uh, the the coefficient of friction uh, laterally for your tires and it's going to behave a little differently from your longitudinal uh, slip and, and and that's why you know your gg diagram it's not always going to be a perfect circle um, you know you it's not going to be you know as uh, strong in terms of longitudinal slip which is why you don't get a lot of you don't get as high uh, you know longitudinal g as you do lateral g but anyhow this is for lateral and as you can see here your your lateral coefficient is actually slightly decreasing as you increase load 
now it's not entirely related to i mean it is related to this you're getting a lot of benefit but what this shows is if you go in this trend long enough there will be a point where too much vertical force is going to cost you because you have more vertical force you might be increasing the lateral force but you're also decreasing that other component which is mu which is the coefficient of friction that's something which we assumed was actually constant in the in, in the in the first slide but the reality is it's not always going to be like that um, now you you're, you're going to you'll you'll have to reach really really high loads and i'm talking about something in terms of you know f3 f1 level loads to really see this effect you won't see it as much in fs but it's important to understand this and and i might be wrong here but as far as i've i've experienced it's not had too much of an effect for the speeds that we have tried uh, but yeah this is something to keep in mind so basically what is all this tie up to well aero performance benefits depend on mechanical balance um balancing your car mechanically inertially you know with your with your center of gravity and your stiffness is just as important as balancing your aero Uh, you can't just throw an aero kit onto the car and then expect it to do wonders and miracles for you it, it doesn't work that way you need to understand at least a significant part of vehicle dynamics um, and and quite a lot at least about uh, you know damper spring anti roll bar performance uh, at the very least and maybe also a little bit of drive train maybe differential performance because all of these things kind of factor into how your car yaws and behaves through a corner uh, but i hope this slide is a little informative to show you that there are pitfalls if if you reach higher speeds and higher loads anyhow uh, this is a little bit about uh, tires so let's get to the aero balance part uh, now i've put cop center of pressure usually you call it cp but uh, cp can also be a uh, uh, pressure coefficient which is something else so that's why i just put cop over here and then of course uh, cg is the center of gravity of the vehicle um this is an old photo of of, of one of our cars from many years ago uh so yeah let's just say you know there are some random uh, cp uh, positions okay so this is the center pressure for the the front wing uh center pressure location of the rear wing center pressure of maybe uh, the rest of the body works um including the diffuser now you might be wondering what center of pressure is well it's very similar to center of gravity um in essence if your if your vehicle is hanging ignoring gravity uh, if, if you apply a uh, you know if you apply a load onto the center of pressure that's where the the car gets balanced because of all the forces you won't have any torque which which is literally basically what it means is you can replace all these points with one common center of pressure point uh now this has obviously you're you're looking at downforce drag but there's also a side force that's acting on your car um and that is because there is a vehicle slip and even if there's no vehicle slip uh your car is tangential instantaneously at that point so uh you know it's not like your car is also curved so however unless you're going at a near near straight line there's always going to be some level of side slip or some uh, component of aerodynamic uh, force acting sideways on the car so let's just assume you know these are maybe the random downforce and drag values or or uh, indicative of downforce and drag acting at these points and then you let's say the effective cop is somewhere here now there are a few things you can uh, you've got to see over here so just like cg uh well cg are only looking at vertical forces but here if your drag forces increase if your drag force on top increases your cop moves up because the vertical position of C center of pressure depends on the lateral forces acting there because you're, you're basically balancing those uh, moments that are created by them the same way if you increase the front down force cp will uh, center of pressure will laterally move uh, towards positive x towards the front of your car uh, and if you increase it in the rear the downforce at the rear is going to move the other way so this is kind of what you need to understand so if you want to lower your cp uh, reduce the drag on your rear wing or if you're willing to do it increase the drag on your front wing uh, it's not as simple as that but it's 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 you know along those lines and the same way if you want to adjust your cp position to either the front or rear of the vehicle adjust the downforce values uh, but let's try to understand why we are even looking at this um let, let's say uh let's see uh, like two cases so this is probably down here you know you have your car with aero let's keep that aside for now uh we look at this case over here where your car does not have aero okay now does not have aero is in quotes because how, however much you try you're always going to have aero on the car because of the car is moving because the car is moving in air or relative to the air so let's make some assumptions and these are not necessarily very good assumptions i'm only telling you but i'm just doing this for simplicity to explain a certain concept here um now let's say the car starts accelerating let, uh, 
let's say you don't have a static a uh, 50/50 static load distribution because when you start moving there's an inertial force and your cg effectively migrates backwards like you put more load on the rear tires uh, and then also you have some center of pressure on the car and some balancing forces from those values those forces everything let's just assume the car somehow reaches an equilibrium point you know you're still going to be constantly giving engine power because you have a lot of resistances mechanical rolling and drag acting on the vehicle but let's just assume you reach a point where the car is at equilibrium but it's moving it's not at rest and you have 50 50 load distribution so in this case well well mg is equal to f f front and f plus f rear so basically you have 50 50 load distribution okay now let's assume we have the same case somehow you've added wings onto it you haven't altered the cg and you haven't altered the uh, mass of the vehicle let's let's just assume that okay, it's not going to happen but let's just assume when you do that you're going to have extra moments created about the center of gravity i don't even look at about the center of gravity you can you can even have it about uh, any of the uh, uh the the contact points on the car contact patches but let's just assume it's uh, you know uh, about the front front contact patch uh, so you have a negative moment because of course um what's it yeah so uh, of course this this goes downwards so you've got your uh, downforce going downwards and that creates a moment in this direction and then of course you also have your drag which also creates a moment in this direction with respect to this position here okay so uh naturally that causes uh, uh two negative moments and what that means is if your center of pressure is above your cg and and it's rearwards it's it's going to pitch the car rearwards um if uh, if it's in front of the cg then depending on your downforce or drag it's going to either pitch it rearwards or potentially in some cases forwards uh, now this is only considering cg uh, there's something else you need to consider i'll get to that in the next slide however what i want you to take from this slide is based on your position of center of pressure you're going to balance loads either to the front or the rear of the vehicle this is very important when you get to the lateral dynamics of the car now obviously that is a flawed uh, example in 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 its essence because what that means is we're doing a lot of assumptions that are not right to be added there firstly weight transfers rearwards during acceleration and braking that's something that's not really considered there it's been considered to be balanced when in reality it doesn't and it doesn't because there are a lot of other mechanical forces acting on the car um what this means is even if equilibrium is attained under constant throttle there's still high like there's still a higher mechanical load on the rear tires um uh, something important to understand weight transfer cannot be uh, you can't just make it disappear okay uh, it's it's always going to be there so you need to adjust your design to optimize it the way you want your car to work um you know either by using springs or dampers just by changing your springs and dampers you're not going to change the weight transfer as such it's just you're you're tra- you're changing the transient to an extent you might be able to change weight transfer that but that's only like when you're in the limit or you're hitting a bump or something like that um but it's important to understand that adding your aero kit is always going to have an effect on your center of gravity and also where your car pitches with respect to load distribution uh, it depends on center of pressure with respect to gravity but the vehicle also pitches uh and it's not only because of cg so obviously you have something called a roll center uh which when you which is what you see when you look at it from the front view but uh, from the side view of the car you have a pitch center uh and based on where your cp is acting with respect to the pitch center uh you're going to have a, a different uh, you know angle of pitch uh, in terms of that force acting on the car uh now this depends on how you've mounted your wings um there are there are two ways As, as far as i know there are two ways you can mount aero kits onto cars one is sprung one is unsprung okay if your car is sprung that means if if your aero kit is mounted as a sprung configuration that means that your aero uh, you know devices are directly placed on the chassis of the vehicle so if there are any forces acting it goes through the chassis and then goes through all the roll mechanics all of the elastic elements as well if you mount your wings uh, as an unsprung kit what that means is you're mounting it onto an unsprung uh, Uh, you know unsprung location a popular place to mount it is on the wheel uprights which is which is the center of that unsprung uh, mass for for the the wheel uh, so by doing so you you have multiple advantages you, you know uh, they don't move with respect to the right height of the vehicle unless of course the wheel itself travels a lot um but uh, more importantly it's not going to have a lot of impact in elastic load transfer um now of course validation becomes an issue later on if you do that uh, so uh, it's it's easier to validate your aero kit if you put it as a sprung kit but there are disadvantages because it moves with the rest of the vehicle so 
uh, aero aero is basically very ride height dependent um, which is what the final point is it's sensitive to speed and pitch in terms of longitudinal dynamics but why are we looking at longitudinal dynamics we've been talking about the longitudinal dynamics of the car all this time when are we, when are we going to get a lateral dynamics well the reason i've been talking about longitudinal is because that's what sets the precedent for precedent for the the, the remaining uh, lateral dynamics of your car so let's get to that before that let's just see what aerodynamic balance does okay so let's take those previous cases where you know you have the cg and then your cop is such that you have 50 50 load distribution if you're center of pressure migrates more rearwards that means you have more normal force on the rear tires and if it's in the front you have more normal force on the front tires um, this is of course we're not considering things like drag because if you know if if your center of pressure is towards the front but it's, it's it's you know the center of pressure also moves upwards because you have a lot of rear wing drag you might get front down first but the car will also pitch rearwards because that rear wing uh, drag causes a moment rearward so it, it might even balance out in that case but let's not assume all of that let's just assume somehow the aero kits have been configured such that you have more rearwards uh, normal force in this and more frontwards normal force here um, as you can see it changes the sorry as you can see, it changes the graphs over here. Um, and based on uh, how much you put on either the rear or the front, your car is either gonna understeer or oversteer. It's very interesting to see this because it's it's kind of opposite to what happens with your mechanical balance or mechanical load. Generally, you know, if you rear, if you push your center of gravity rearwards, you're you're loading the rear tires. Yes, you're vertically loading them more, uh, but actually only marginally compared to what aero is doing in this case. And not only that, by rear by inertially loading the rear tires. They're going to have to give a lot more lateral force to balance the large yaw moment created by the front tires. So that's why if you have your your uh, center of gravity rearwards, you're going to tend to oversteer at times. So you know if you have that sort of configuration and you want to balance that out, let's say you've tried your best to put your uh, center of gravity at the center, but for some reason it's gone to the rear of your car. But you have an aero kit. If you add some rear downforce. What that does is it adds some corning stiffness. It it increases the limit of static friction. So in a way, the rear needs more lateral force, but it's able to get that because you have more rearwards normal force. So there are different ways you can play around with aero and mechanical balance. But hopefully, what you can understand from this slide is more rearwards normal force tends to give you understeer, uh, neutral steer for 50-50, and oversteer of front is more biased. Considering everything else is not a factor. Uh, now, you know, we see this a lot of times in a lot of discussions. Um, it's not a very healthy way of going about it because there's no real way to just change stuff. Like I remember reading a recent uh, uh, discussion on, on one of the FSA uh, uh, groups about uh, changing the roll center and will it actually, uh, changing the front roll center, how is it going to change the rest of the car? I mean, it's really not as simple as that. There's so many other factors that change, like the camber of your tires, uh, you know, the inclinations. Uh, but in essence, just... You know, for understanding, it's always easy to simplify things like this, just to see what will happen to your car if this parameter alone changes somehow magically. And you know, this is kind of what aero balance does to your car. But yeah, now let's get to the roll and yaw, because this is this is where things start to get real. Um, let's consider two cases over here. So firstly, you have a uh, understeer here on the on the right uh, and oversteer here. I've just placed them side by side. Assume they have the same cornering radius. Okay. Um, so an understeer, as we had seen, you know, the, the vehicle velocity is, is inwards compared to the vehicle head, uh, the, the direction of the vehicle. Um, sorry. Uh, so, yeah. And, and in the other case, in, in oversteer, your, your slip is outwards. That means that uh, your, your vehicle velocity is trying to overtake the, the, the front tire. So it's, it's going outwards with respect to the direction of the chassis. Um, now, these two are, there are two different slip cases. And what you can see here is, if, if I've shown here that the center of pressure has actually moved towards the side where the vehicle velocity is going. And, and, and that's actually interesting. So if you, you know, we turn your head a little bit this way for the oversteer case, you can see that the vehicle is actually angled with respect to the, the, the velocity of the car. And because of that, center of pressure is on that side. Because, because there's a slip, there's going to be a lot of side force on that end. So your, your car is going to be influenced. And that's why the center of pressure moves to that side. If the vehicle is uh, yawing in, so if the vehicle is slipping inwards, then your center of pressure will be on the inside of the vehicle. Always remember that. So now let's assume you know we have a we have a standard car, center of pressure behind the CG in the first case. Okay. In that case, when you see oversteer from the front view, let's assume, let's just assume, you know, 
parole center somewhere here, the CG somewhere here, and then your center of pressures over here. Now, because your oversteer is uh, because you have oversteer over there, what happens is your car is turning inwards, uh, but that uh, the the force is acting. You know, uh, the there's a component of force pushing the car from the front from this view. Um, so if you see that the car is actually going to yaw outwards. So when you have oversteer and your center of pressure is behind your CG, uh, the 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 side force that you're getting because of the center pressure locations is actually going to correct your car slightly. And you can actually see this in, uh, in race car aerodynamics by Joseph Katz. There'll be a picture where it's a proper side force of, of a car going through, you know, cars going on a road, let's say uh, something like, uh, you know, I suppose it's running on Isle of Man or something like that. And there's this draft wind that comes between two walls. If it hits it at that angle, you can already see from that image, um, having a center of pressure behind their CG stabilizes. So this is kind of a more practical example because we're not only looking at wind, we're actually looking at the vehicle slip itself. Um, this is probably the first mistake which uh, many would do. And I've also done this while designing is not considering vehicle slip. Uh, and then just considering that the air velocity is always, you know, along the, the line of the, the car. Um, and just simply placing the CG at the back because a book says is not a good excuse. Um, you need to use, uh, it's not a good validation. In fact, it's, it's a bad excuse rather. Um, so you need to consider the slip. So uh, I hope you understand this. Feel free to pause it here later on when you play back the video if, if you want to get a better idea. Uh, so let's see, in, in unders here again, it's it's uh, the central pressure is behind the CG, so because of that, from the top view, you know it's it's going to correct the understeer. So instead of the car rotating uh, counterclockwise with respect to this view, this moment will convert it to a clockwise rotation slightly. It'll counter it, and as a result, it auto corrects it to an extent. Of course, the driver still has to do his work, his or her work, but uh, the uh, the uh, center of pressure location can help the driver in their uh, ability to slightly correct the car. Then you have central pressure in front of the CG. So in, in, in this case, uh, what will happen is uh, because it's in the front and, and if you have that side force, it's going to rotate the car in the direction that the car is already trying to rotate or the car is being forced to rotate because of oversteer. So as a result, it can lead to oversteer. Uh, it's not always going to happen, but there is a good chance that it can happen if, if you're not careful. Um, and then the same thing is going to happen in, uh, in in the case of understeer. It's going to rotate it in the understeering direction that the car is already unfortunately rotating. So uh, you you want to try to avoid these things. Of course, uh, it'll be good to uh, when you get when you test your aero kit. It's it's good to get your drivers into the car and get their opinion on on uh, how how the car is behaving. Uh, a driver would uh, you know they would either be able to cope with it or not. So it's good to get a wide range of opinions. But again, that's qualitative testing. We'll get to that later. Uh, but this, I hope this gives you an idea of how it's not just raw side force in the in the, in the the form of some wind that's hitting the car. You're always going to have side forces because of the vehicle slip angle. Mistake number one is this. And and, and please try to avoid this because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it's something that I wish I had focused a lot more on while I was designing my kits because that could have given a more holistic approach. But please consider vehicle slip. It's very important for what we're going to talk about next, which is Aero map. Um, I think I'm not going fast enough. Uh, I have a lot of stuff to cover, so I'll try to keep this short and simple. Uh, so let's say, okay, here we've uh, we've got a car. Um, it has a certain ride height. Now, what you have here is is a ride height map. Your front ride height over here, and a rear ride height over here. Okay, and based on where your car is. So let's say we go back to this. Uh, the car is like fully pressed down because of downforce and you have maximum downforce, maximum spring compression. So it's like, uh, so uh, more, almost maximum spring compression, assuming, you know, you, your bump stops or something are not fully compressed. Um, this is where your uh, front right height lies. Okay, then when you slam the brakes, your car is going to dip a little bit more in front and the rear is also still going to be slightly pressed down. It's not going to completely lift because you still have downforce, but there's still some vertical force that pushes it up. Okay, and then your car starts easing. You start easing off the brakes. Your driver will start trail braking. Uh, and slowly, you know, get the car into a rhythm and they'll reach this point where your car is in the middle of the corner. Okay. And then again, you accelerate from the corner, your rear dips and your front also slightly dips because your downforce starts to increase. Now, what this is called is a ride height envelope. And this is very important for manipulating your performance, manipulating the performance of your aero kit by changing your mechanical setup. Okay. So this is kind of an average approximate, uh, uh, downforce and uh, downforce, uh, versus ride height aero map. Uh, don't pay attention to the, the colors because I've just put them randomly for now, but let's just assume this is the front down first. That's the rear down first. Okay. Hi, this. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you can, yeah. you can take your time. Don't worry about speeding up. You can take your time. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned that. So I just wanted to let you know, you can take your time. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So let's say this is, this is your arrow map for your, for basic uh, vehicle setup. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. So this is your rear ride height and, uh, let's say this is the, uh, the movement. Okay. The bound, the Johnson uh, rebound, uh, uh, movement, the, the limits of your movement. And then you have the, uh, the that's what this indicates the ride height, uh, the extent, the extent of the rear ride height part of the uh, ride height envelope. Then you've got that at the front for the front ride height uh, and uh, the front ride height. And these are the limits of the front ride height over here. Um, that's what is indicated here at, with this arrow. So, you know, based on uh, how much your car moves. So if your front and rear moves uniformly, um, you're, you're gonna have your arrow map kind of move in some sort of a linear form uh, along this. Now, this is not, you know, there are a lot of other things to consider, kinematics, uh, a lot of suspension play and all of that. I'm not, I, I'm not considering any of them now, just for simplicity. Now, if you bring the right height down, your arrow map can move downward. So, you know, I hope you're getting the idea now that if you move your arrow map around, you can actually affect, okay, at this point, I don't want as much downfall. So let, let me, let me maybe push it up. So then you can kind of manipulate your arrow map to move, you know, vertically up. Um, so let's say, let's go back to the base configuration. Uh, so that is, if you change the, 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 like both of them uniformly, if you only change the front or rear right height, uh, you, you can move them either downwards, upwards, or lat, like, you know, uh, horizontally uh, parallel to the axis is basically. So that's what you can do. Um, if, if you change, you know, uh, the, you know, let's say you change the amount of jounce or rebound, for example, uh, by changing the springs or changing the preload or whatever, uh, what you can do is stretch and, 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 and skew the arrow map in these directions. And then I hope by now you're getting the idea. You can do a huge combination of things and skew it all over the place just to get it in the zone that you want. Now, it's not really a good idea to do this because what you should be doing is designing your base arrow kit so it works really well in that format, but it's not always going to happen. Uh, and that's why you need to focus on setup uh, quite a lot in Formula Student as well. But uh, uh, having done a lot of, uh, having done some race engineering, I know that it's, it's very important to play around with setup. You can't just get the perfect car that everyone can drive on any, any track. Now, this is an example of an arrow map uh, around Le Mans. Um, so here you can see in this case, you know, front ride height, I've put it on the X axis and then uh, the, the Y axis is uh, the rear ride height. Um, and you can already see, see the, the green setup has a little bit more movement in, in terms of uh, rear and uh, front ride height. So there's more play in that, uh, you know, we're running softer springs, and, and but uh, you know, you're, you're still running the same base ride height because you can see that, you know, it's kind of compressing to the same amount, but it's just, we've increased the rebound over here. I think this was something we did uh, for one of my, uh, one of my assignments during MSC. So this was, it was interesting to make a uh, different setups for, for qualifying and race for a Le Mans uh, endurance uh, race. So that's kind of what this is. So I hope that gives you an insight to what you can do with aero maps and how important they are. But now let's get to the aero devices. So remember we were talking about that plate before. This is kind of what the downforce versus angle of attack map is. So angle of attack is what angle your plate makes with respect to the flow of air. Um, and there is a point where it peaks because of turbulence, uh, because the air breaks free. Uh, that's why you can use something called an airfoil. So it's a lot more, um, you know, it's a lot more efficient in terms of the amount of downforce it can give for a given angle of attack. And it also has a higher limit. Generally, airfoils can go all the way up to maybe 11 to 12 degrees before you start feeling some sort of turbulence based on the airfoil you use. Um, but these are things you can you can definitely play around with and try using uh, something called Java foil. Uh, and I've, I've linked, I've mentioned that in references at the end. Um, so let's say is in different angles, this is kind of what the flow is going to be like. And when you reach something like 15 degrees, you know, you, you're going to start reaching this point where uh, it starts breaking free. And then you reach a stagnation point where your wing doesn't give any more downforce. And then it drops along this graph. So, you know, 15 is kind of where it starts dropping in, in an average case. Now, the reason for that is this, this region gets de-energized basically. Uh, what that means is there's no controlled flow over here. And despite being turbulent, it still has a, a negative effect on downforce, which means it starts lifting the airfoil. Um, so in order to prevent that, you want to somehow send some more air over here, re-energize this flow and kind of speed it up, increase the kinetic energy there. Uh, and that's why you use something called a multi-element wing. Um, so let's say you make a little slot over here. Um, and instantly, you know, you start getting a lot of velocity uh, going through that little slot and that re-energizes that zone and it makes air, uh, makes the flow stick. So something very important to understand is airflow likes to stick to each other, like air likes sticking to itself. Uh, it's, 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 it's better that way. As long as it, if it starts breaking free, that's why it breaks free from a surface because it wants to stick with itself, it breaks free from the surface, you're going to have turbulence. So try your best to always energize zones like this, energize these little pockets. 
Of course, this is not a very good design because you have this little corner over here. So now you can make it into an airfoil, smoothen it out, and you get a little bit better performance. So that's kind of what a multi-element wing runs like. Now, this is what you do for a, for a front wing is something called ground effect. Uh, you know, closer you are to the ground to an extent, uh, the faster your airflow can be, be beneath the, between the wing and the ground. And that basically creates a, a higher suction. Um, now, that, that is a little bit about front wings, uh, front wing ground effects. Uh, it's very important to uh, understand that front wings are affected by uh, the, the flow around uh, the, the rotation of your front wheels as well. So be very careful when you're playing around with that because your front wheels can throw off the effect of your front wing. So basic thing. Then of course you need end plates on your wings. Uh, you have a lot of high pressure on the top, low pressure below, and then air tends to kind of flow over the ends. So um, so be, uh, you need to have some sort of device to close that air and prevent those vortices from uh, from being formed. Um, that's why you have an end plate and that channels the flow prevents uh, the, the, you know, it prevents uh, any sort of turbulence effects from that, any losses of downforce. Downside to end plates, however, are if you have very big end plates, you're going to angle more of that end plate for uh, more area for your side force. So if you make your rear wing end plates way too big, your center pressure will move backwards. It's the trick if you can't get it to work any other way. That's one way to migrate your CP backwards. The same for the front. That's a little bit about end plates. Uh, and we'll talk about diffusers real quick. So generally, if your car, if this is, let's say this is a stock car, okay, it's from NASCAR. Um, so in this case, you have the ground effect. It's essentially a tunnel below the car and it, it, it uh, speeds up the car, uh, speeds up the flow underneath the car. But when you reach this point, you have turbulence because the flow is suddenly released into air. So it goes over this little cornered edge and then becomes really turbulent. Now, something about turbulent flow, uncontrolled turbulent flow actually has a lot of energy, very, uh, a lot of velocity. Uh, and, and there are pockets of really low pressure because of that. So essentially that actually becomes a low pressure zone. So these are the pressure points, high pressure over here, moderately high here, that causes downforce. Then you have low pressure across, uh, uh, low pressure at the back. So you actually have a drag force rearwards. This is what you call induced drag, something that's also very, very common in aero. Uh, so be aware of what, what the sort of induced drag you bring. Um, then you have downforce and that's what it is. So now if you have something called a diffuser, it's basically an expansion chamber. You're controlling the release of air behind the car. Uh, in this case, you have a controlled flow over here and it doesn't have as low pressure as what you had before. What that means is that the induced drag is slightly smaller because the pressure differential across this car longitudinally is less. Um, so that's why you use a diff diffuser. It's to control the flow outwards from the car. And if you design it properly, you can actually get a surge of low pressure right at that expansion chamber point. And you get extra downforce as a result of that little uh, surge, of surge of low pressure over here, or surge of velocity. Um, now, we're not promoting any wheel-to-wheel racing in this competition, but I like talking about this because it is actually a really good series to look at. It's NASCAR. And you can understand the effects of slipstreaming from this. So for those of you who don't know, NASCAR is a drafting sport, more of, most of it. Uh, you know, where, uh, It's an American stock car sport where they run in ovals. Um, and it's all about slipstreaming. Uh, it's, 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 it's basically an aero sport, if you ask me. Um, so we'll talk about bump drafting. Okay, so these NASCAR cars actually don't have proper diffusers. As far as I know, they don't have solid diffuser designs, which is actually the reason why people use bump drafting. So let's say this is the airflow between these two cars. Okay, uh, the number 15 cuts through high, high pressure stagnant air. It's doing a lot of work to cut through air and then it releases a lot of turbulent air because it doesn't have a diffuser. So it's like that first case we had seen. It's a lot of induced drag, okay? Uh, because of that high induced drag due to pressure differential. Now, number 24 is benefiting from a slipstream because there's slightly lower pressure and it's not stagnant air. So this guy is able, this, uh, this car is able to like kind of cut through this air. Um, and then it starts speeding up. And of course, as, as usual, this is also releasing turbulent air, but this pressure differential is actually not as bad. So in essence, because the pressure differential is not too bad, 24 is speeding up. So there are two ways to look at this. Either 24 is getting a pocket of air and speeding up, or he's having to face less pressure from the front. And I think it's better to look at it in the second scenario where he's facing less pressure because that's what helps you understand how aero actually works. Um, so as a result, 24 speeds up uh, and then the driver squeezes the air between those two cars. What that does is it, 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 it actually makes the air slightly static between those two cars. It increases the pressure over there because that volume decreases, uh, but, but it's, it's kind of compressing the air. Uh, as a result, 
uh, the air pressure behind the 15 increases. So the pressure differential for the 15 is not as high now. And then the 15 also starts speeding up. So it's kind of like, a, it's, it's a towing effect where both cars are, are involved, both cars benefit. It's really interesting. You might think, okay, the first car is the only one doing all of the work, cutting through the air, and the benefit is going to the car behind. But the first car is also getting a benefit because the car behind is closing the gap. So car behind is making up for the law, lack of a diffuser for the car in front. So in essence, what you have is uh, two cars, two times the horsepower. So there's nothing magical there. No new power or energy is coming, but they're essentially having a lot less induced drag than each one would have had if they were running alone. So that's what bump drafting does. Now, why am I talking about all of this? This is NASCAR and it's racing. It's not FSA. It's not, but just by understanding the way pressure actually works by looking at it in terms of pressure and not just air hitting the car really helps you appreciate the performance and it helps you understand how your devices can work better. Then you have the same thing, but in uh, side drafting, I'm sorry, it says, should say side drafting over there. If a car comes close to the car in front and they squeeze the air over here, you can accelerate the air between those two, these two cars and send it onto the rear spoiler. And as a result, this adds more drag for the car. So you can use this side drafting technique to slow the car that you're trying to overtake. Um, not, not very, I mean, it's ethical, it's racing, but, uh, it's, it's just another way to use aero to help yourself and not help your competitor. If you don't want to be a draft partner, if you just want to push that car out of the way, that's kind of a side draft. Um, now, you know, they're, they're different. Uh, these are, uh, different, uh, there's a GP3 and a GTE car. So you can see, uh, these sort of cars have, uh, you know, front splitters instead of front wings and kind of acts as a sort of suction diffuser in the front. Um, and then yeah, they have very complex diffuser design. So based on how you design your diffuser, uh, you can optimize the, the, uh, sort of, uh, ejection of uh, air from behind the car. Then of course, different types of wings. Um, then you have, uh, you know, this is a basic example of, uh, a basic example of, uh, of, of front wings and using, you know, simple multi-element wings. So this is a, a Lotus from, from long back, uh, an F1. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a simple design, but it does the job. You have something called a, a barge board. It's kind of like a barge board. What it does, it sends velocity outwards. Um, so that, you know, it sends all this fast turbulent air outwards so that it doesn't uh, affect the rear wing. Um, you know, the front wing does a lot of the work, generates a lot of downforce because it has free flow in front. Uh, rear wing, you know, gets uh, gets affected by what you're doing in the front. So it's it's not a very useful component. It's more of a balancing component. So you want to do everything you can to send air away from this channel over here. Um, you want to make sure that this channel of the car is kind of as clean as possible so that air can actually go on to the rear wing. Uh, so this is kind of just quick examples of uh, the, the way these kits are, uh, you know, included on these cars. Then you have the Indy car, you know, if you have a road car, you're, you're, um, if you're going to have the speedway configuration of the Dallara chassis, you want to make sure you can go a lot faster on the straights uh, and, and then optimize slipstreaming. Uh, but, you know, look at this car here. It has wings and downforce generating devices everywhere that they could squeeze because they're trying to maximize the performance. So depending on your need, you need to either decrease drag, increase downforce, or if you're really good, Try doing both because that'll help you a lot. Uh, but it's all about balance at the end of the day. Um, anyhow, that's uh, pretty much it about devices. Let's get to the important stuff. Um, let's get to the application. When and how can a team start with their aero development? The answer, immediately and pragmatically. Start your aero development imp immediately. Whether you need it on your car or not, start understanding whether you need it or not, because you can't decide that until you do it. Even if you're a new team, start looking into this because down the line, it's going to help you. And if you bring validation showing that despite being a new team, you've still done some aero calculations to show what you understand. It's going to give you some brownie points in the event. Be pragmatic, be practical more than anything. Aero is about being practical. It's not about being fancy, putting some cool stuff on the car. If it works, put it on the car. It's as simple as that. So how do we start with the concept? Yes, manufacturing constraints and lack of funds is a hurdle. Yep, being a new team with limited experience uh, uh, resulting in, in slightly heavier cars is a challenge. Uh, however, given that many teams, you know, there are a lot of teams that have single single cylinder engines that are able to uh, considered underpowered that are able to put excellent aero kits on their cars. So it's definitely possible. There's there's no harm in calculating and bringing your, your things because that can really help in, in the long run. Um, so where do we start? Yeah, when do you when when can you build an aero pack and put it on the car for the event? Well, whenever you reach the limit of your current vehicle's capabilities, it's as simple as that. 
um doesn't stop you from calculating but understand that error is not a necessity error devices downforce devices are not a necessity uh, they're a performance feature on the car okay it's a, it's a performance device it's it's what it's meant to do uh, what can you weigh your error performance when can you weigh your error performance and decide if it's worth it when you're confident in your vd so unless you're confident with your vehicle dynamics you won't know when you need error can an error package add points in static events depends on your validation validation and validation that's it if you can't validate your error kit you're not going to get points it's 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 basically like that it's it's like that for any subsystem so don't put the error kit on your car unless you can validate it feel free to do the calculations but don't put it on your car if you can't validate can an error package uh, add points in dynamics depends on your setup compromises and testing at the end of the day it's 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 simple you you can have a car which you might not know a lot about but somehow you can magically do well in dynamics it it can happen uh, but yeah that's why it's important to test so that's out of the way let's start with lap time simulation okay consider using optimum lap to start your design because uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a point mass simulation so it's not going to give you too much data but it'll at least give you a good compromise of whether you're uh, losing horsepower or not whether it's a horsepower hog or not okay uh, do batch runs for cl versus cd so that's that's the best thing you can do fix a specific uh, frontal area and then start doing batch runs between your coefficient of lift and drag okay so these are sort of plots you can create uh, maximum lateral g's Uh, so I'll tell you what sort of lateral Gs you're able to pull, and then lap time. Now, unsurprisingly, you're going to be able to pull off more lateral Gs and better lap time uh, if if you have higher downforce. If you don't change drag, but as soon as you start changing drag, you're going to throw off the balance, which in this case is not applicable because it's point mass. But you're going to have effects in lap time because if you increase your drag, if you increase CL, there's a good chance your CD will increase. So be careful how you're compromising between these two. Uh, these are some good metrics to use. then of course fuel consumption very important to understand whether it's a horsepower hog whether you're having to spend too much energy maximum lateral g's of course naturally it's it's going to give you something it's going to tell you uh, i'm sorry this it's not maximum lateral g's this is uh, maximum longitudinal deceleration my bad um, so here it'll tell you how much you can decelerate so it helps you understand whether your vehicle is going to break well with aero it's going to slow down if you're going to use your brakes well with aero uh, but again there's a point mass simulation so don't take too much of this into into solid consideration it's just a, it's just a good reference for you um the better tools you can use that you can develop on your own to get better results but this is excellent for starting i would highly recommend using this to start off with a uh, percentage time spent on full throttle also tells you how much you can actually see the more you spend time on full throttle through corners the more you're confident your aero kit is actually working and you're not losing a uh, grip and again sorry about this it's again uh, you know percentage spent in corners once again so yeah see that, that those are some of the metrics you can look at more most importantly of all it's track characterization you're coming to formula berlin don't bring results for formula sud in germany unless you're going to go to formula sud in germany with the same car because it's pointless if you're going to come to formula bharat only if that's the only event you're focusing on for your current aero kit bring results for formula bharat don't say that you can't find it online cuz you can use either old you can use old gps data from your car or some sort of camera technique to figure out the radius and stuff and if you don't have gps techniques gps and all of all of those features it, it most likely means that you're a relatively new team that's not run on track so it's really not worth getting into that level but bare minimum you can do is try to somehow reconstruct that track and start looking at things like lateral acceleration and longitudinal acceleration this tells you how fast you're going uh, and also percentage of throttle now uh, my thesis was based on track characterization and uh, one thing you can look at is you know amount of percentage of time you're spending in certain corners percentage of time you're spending on straights so it gives you an optimal compromise if i add aero this much percentage will be increased in corners i won't have if i add aero i'll have to still deal with drag for this much percentage of the track on straights things like this use these compromises to to your advantage okay uh, then again uh, what you need to really look at is steering angle yaw acceleration corner radius yaw velocity yaw acceleration uh, you know the, these uh, different parameters are very important to look at now you might not find all of these in optimum lab uh, understandable because it's a point sim point uh, you know it's a point mass simulation but if you consider that it's always neutral steering you can back calculate and somehow try to extract some sort of steering angle plot it's not going to be too accurate but it's just a, a, a sort of a, you know work around to the to the lack of this feature if you want to try it but uh, do it at your own risk because it's not a perfect methodology but these are some other traces which will be useful for you to use so if you do some other lap sim and some other uh, more uh, with more uh, complicated uh, inputs then this is something to consider 
Okay, so use these observations to choose the optimal compromise between CL and CD. Work with your powertrain team. Ask them, is it okay to have this much BHP loss over a lap because we add aero? Talk to your vehicle dynamics team and your powertrain team. Ask, is this much weight an issue for, for adding aero? This is what you need to do. These are things that you have to do in conceptualization. The whole team has to work together to get the concept ready. Then you kind of split away and do your own work. Uh, for example, how much improvement will maximum lateral G by 0.2 help in the long run? Consider all your events. Okay, consider you're on. You're going for four different events. You're not just going for endurance. Although that's the maximum points haul, and pretty much is a good sign that you'll get a good position. You want to complete all the dynamics competitively. Will it make you faster? How much fuel? What is your efficiency score? If I add aero, do I need a bigger fuel tank? Is it going to make my car heavier? Is it going to cost me my efficiency score? All of this is important. Understand what you're prioritizing in the event. Calculate relative points with respect to last year, and then go ahead. Again, I'm saying it this way. Don't take it that you have to do. This is just this is just my, my style of saying it. I'm just saying, you know, these are some of the things you can do. Um, but yeah, let's start. do a 1D simulation with optimum lab. Determine, determine realistic uh, CD target based on BHP losses. Yeah, then choose a good CL target based on that, uh, based on the load sensitivities to an extent. But more importantly, try some aero, aero designs on your own first. Get a feel for it. Figure out how much downforce can you actually get with the amount of drag. How good are you in designing? Use that as a benchmark and over the course of four months of designing, you'll slowly get better. Um, choose CD, then choose CL. Run skid pad simulations, right? Um, and uh, what that does is, uh, you know, work along with your VD team, determine observed or desired steering response, lateral Gs, et cetera, for different radii. Don't run skid pad for just the skid pad event, okay? Run a skid pad simulation for the slowest, for the smallest radius and also for the largest radius in the whole track. Okay, choose ideal aero and mechanical balances for highest downforce configuration for the most important corners of the circuit. Remember, you're using these high downforce devices to help you in the most important corners of our endurance and to an extent even skid pad. So make sure you uh, you you look into those things. Have a rough idea of roll centers, G, uh, CG location, roll rates, ride heights, spring rates, all of these things that you can tune. While, while, while setting up your car, look into them. They're very, very important. Don't play around with aero. Don't add aero unless you're willing to do some tuning to your car. Um, because uh, chances are to make a perfect car statically is, is, is very difficult and it's, it, and you're, you're dealing with compliant, uh, ob objects. So, uh, make sure you can actually uh, work with those things. Most likely, most likely the, that most desired event should be an endurance event for all of these setups. Okay. But if you have like adjustable wings and all that, open them up for acceleration. If they're allowed in rules, I haven't read the, the, the core rules for the recent thing yet, but, but I, I think so you can, you can change static configuration of wings or even with a DRS. At this point, you know what your roll angle, wheel loads and all of those things are, including aero by this point. And now you can kind of split away and start designing your components. So do all of these things before you get into actually designing. So if you can do all of these things without even designing an aero kit, this is already a good start. Whether you're planning to put aero or not, it's always good to have these sort of things with you. Okay. Now the design flow. Uh, now, you see, it gets complicated. Uh, so you have high dependence of front. Uh, so see, the front nose kind of doesn't depend on upstream. Same with the front wing to an extent. However, the nose kind of in affects the way the front wing works. Um, and then the underbody has low de dependence as well. It mainly depends on how you send air from the front wing and uh, and the nose to the underside of the car. So these are things that are you know relatively less dependent. But as you go further down the car, orange means it's more dependent on upstream. So the way the radiator and all your airflow into the sideboard and exhaust as well works uh, for cooling is, is, is based off uh, how your air uh, is, is uh, sent by these two devices in front. And also the side pods, if you have uh, air coming out from the sides. And then rear wing depends a lot on everything else. So uh, understand that to design the rear wing perfectly, you need to do full car simulations. No, but design accessibility. Let's let's talk realistically. You want to design it in this way, but you're not always going to be able to do that. Why is that? Firstly, your nose and your front wing are both around the front A cabin. And when you start your design, the A cabin is kind of, I would say one of the last things that fully get finalized because it depends so much on things like your brakes and your steering column and your and more importantly, your tie rods and your suspension configuration. And again, once all of those are decided, your chassis person will start working on that. So you can't do any of that properly until your chassis is set. It's more important to make sure you clear those rules before you start throwing on bodyworks. Underbody, to an extent, you can do it. I think the only downside is 
you don't know much about your differential or spool assembly over here or engine. So C cabin can become a bit of an issue, but you can always start with preliminary design, understanding how things are flowing underneath. Side pod also needs some dependency on this. So you can't immediately start this, especially if you're playing around with ergonomics and changing your B cabin and your radiator design hasn't even been confirmed yet. <laughs> that leaves you with the rear wing. That's perhaps the easiest thing to start with. Doesn't depend on anything much. It just depends on rules. So you start playing around and developing your rear wing. So, you know, kind of if you club this qualitatively, you see this is kind of the distribution. Uh, so, you know, start working with the rear wing, get a rough idea of the values you can attain. Those aren't final because you're not getting anywhere near that. If you do some simulations for rear wing and free flow, take it for granted, you're not getting that amount of downforce. Okay, you need to use other design features to improve the rear wing's performance. Then you move on to the underbody preliminary, of course, is when you start off. While the rest of your team is kind of working on all of these parts of the car, you as a narrow department, you can start working on these things. From there, go up to the side pods. So hopefully by this time, engine calculations are done. You know, some sort of flow rate that you need. Start constructing a basic side pod. Again, you can't do anything properly with the side pod until these are finished, but get a rough understanding. Hopefully by this point, a couple of months in or one month in, you have a good idea of the front A cabin and you can start working on the front wing and the nose cone. Start with the front wing first and then start adjusting your nose cone accordingly. And once you do that, go back to this. So repeating cycle after that, keep going through. Once you have all these things set in one cycle, then you can do full car simulation, tune this, full car simulation, tune this, and so on. If you have the computational resources. This is just one way to do it. I'm just showing this because it's not as simple as just starting with the front wing. Think about the rest of your team and what they're doing because that's very, very important while developing aero. Aero is literally like the last thing that gets even assembled onto the car, in fact. So just be aware of all that. Simulation, uh, I'm not getting too much into this because we've had uh, some really good presentations uh, showing CFD in the past, but you know, get your CAD model ready, focus on your domain size, very important. Don't put a tiny domain around your vehicle. You're going to get back pressure, you're going to get backwards flow. Your simulation is going to crash. So I'm not really sure how you can do a tiny domain simulation and get perfect results. You won't. Okay. Fluid also takes time. If you're doing a transient simulation, it's even worse, but even for a, for a long-term static simulation, it's still going to take time. You need a bigger domain size. Choose the right mesh type, quality, physic model, solvers, you know, the usual. Um, when you get to post-processing, look at turbulence models, uh, turbulence effects, pressure, velocity contours, all of these. Uh, feel free to look through these later. Um, okay, use sequence contour planes. This shows you, uh, you know, in a quasi-static way how, to, how, to, how the pressure varies. Uh, vorticity plots, use Q criterion. These are there in uh, popular uh, CFD software to uh, visualize induced drag. Uh, we can do, uh, you know, more detailed quasi-static simulations. This is what a uh, uh, coefficient of pressure plot is. And it gives you a good holistic view of how your pressure is varying uh, longitudinally al along your car. Um, then you have streamlines, general flow. You know, it just helps you in validation, which we'll get to soon. Uh, I'm just about almost done. So we'll just quickly go through this and get to validation. Um, so, yeah, how would you, how would you, so, so, so how would you actually go about doing these CFD iterations? Well, rear wing, you need to do it with these components because it's dependent on all upwards flow. Front wing is better run with rotating wheels, side pods, and nose cone to understand the front part of the car properly. Uh, and then diffuser simulations, if you have a front wing uh, and nose cone, it's really good because that sets the precedent for the flow. Uh, rear wing is important because if your rear wing is putting some undue pressures downwards, it's going to affect the exit uh, of, your, of your diffuser. And also rotating wheels. Most, most often than not, your diffuser is releasing somewhere near your wheels, unless I think the rules permit almost like 200 or 250 mm rearwards, but I need to check that. But yeah, it's always going to be near the wheels, so be aware of that. Wheels are kind of your biggest enemy, the tires rather. Um, it's, it's what you're doing it for. You're doing all this for the tires, but it's also your biggest enemy as an aerodynamicist. Keep this in mind. Um, yeah, so... One thing you need to see, of course, aero maps, underbody pressure contours, bodywork surface streamlines. And there's a reason for this. This is for validation. Now, why do you, how do you do the full car simulations? There's some potential combinations. Even if you do 10 different front ride heights by 10 different rear ride heights by five vehicle slip angles, it's going to give you 500 combinations. You do about 15 hour simulations for each. It's going to take you 312 days of constant running to get this done. Even if you do five by five by five, that gives you 125 combinations and that gives you 78 days of, of, of simulation time. Then you get to FRH, RRH as, as 10 different combinations, preset combinations and five vehicle slip angles. And these are 50 combinations, which again takes you 31 running simulation days. So this just shows you that it's important to do, you know, at least do something like this because it'll help you in the long run for validation. 
uh, computational power is your biggest hurdle. I would I would say if anyone asks me why you didn't put an arrow kit, uh, I would say because I couldn't validate because my computational power is the hurdle. Because if if you don't have the right simulations, you can't validate it against them. So be be aware. This is one thing you need to keep in mind. Um, so yeah. Uh, sorry, what's it? Yeah. So uh, how do you use the simulation? So do a, make a bicycle model. Add your downforce values from slip angle arrow map. Use it as a lookup table. Use something like MATLAB. Uh, with your bicycle model, add these and then understand transient cornering performance in 2D plane because it'll vary the amount of front load. Um, this is not useful for roll dynamics because bicycle model is just a top view. But use a, a downforce versus slip angle uh, arrow map that you generate and that'll help you better understand this. It'll give you a more holistic, a wholesome uh, a bicycle model. Then you have a full car model. So use downforce values from slip angle versus FRH versus RH. Right, uh, arrow map as a lookup table that gives you a full car simulation considering your roll pitch and everything in 3D. So this is perhaps the best uh, simulation you can do. Manufacturing, be careful. You need to make accurate core shapes, integrate mouths within the layout, regulate resin usage. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here, so I'm just going to flick through it. Feel free to pause and look. I think these are quite self-explanatory. Develop the skeleton. You can make your wing inserts, then look at your core material. Be careful with your core material and then integrate the mounts into it. Follow a good ray up process. I think it's very important that you regulate your uh, resin usage. If you can use vacuum bagging, perfect. If you use pre-preg along with that, even better. Uh, reduce your resin. That's why your aero kit becomes heavy because of your core material inserts and resin. It's not the carbon fiber itself that does much. Um, make sure uh, this is, requires an artisan skill set. So you know, get your best hands in the team on board for this. Compliance testing. Uh, these are the rules. Be aware of those. Um, you know, mount the devices properly, reference chassis positions, use jigs. I tell you the biggest issue with the whole aero package development is mounting it. That's something that we struggle a lot with. It's something that many will struggle with if you don't use proper jigs. In fact, develop jigs like the ones you use for the chassis and that will help you in the long run. But be aware, aero is all hand laid up, so it's difficult to get perfectly accurate results. It's not being machined in a five axis mill. So just be aware of that. Okay, let's get to the final part. Validation. Low visualization paint, okay? This is useful for understanding your streamlines. Uh, get some get some sort of solvent that has a low boiling point, uh, but high viscosity, uh, relatively medium to high viscosity, depends on what you want, uh, and get a good uh, solute, something like chalk, something that's semi-miscible with this. Spray it all over the side of your wings, run your car. Over time, as the air flows through, it evaporates all these solvents, and you get these streamlines. Validate that with those streamlines you get in CFD. It shows a rough estimate of whether your CFD is showing the right streamlines. Use tufts for the same thing. Put these little woolen tufts or string tufts on your car. Mount a GoPro or something in some, some part of the wing and then observe the flow. Again, very simple procedures you can use. But it's very subjective. It's not calculated. There are no values. Do multiple skid pads. Do it for different radii, like I told you. know. Uh, extract GPS data. Obtain maximum lateral Gs. You validated your concept. Extract differential pressure values by using differential sensors, differential pressure sensors, um, and you can get a CFD map. You get a pressure map, a contour, pressure contour map of real life, and you compare it with CFD, see how much error is there in CFD. Extract potentiometer deflection channels. This shows you elastic load transfer. So this is where you consider things like pitch center, roll center, and then you obtain your pitch, roll, uh, pitch and roll uh, values, elastic load transfer values. And also you can use that to change ride height, spring and dampers, optimize your aero map set up for the, for the, for the best possible event. Um, coast down testing. Again, do a straight line test, accelerate to a speed, lift the throttle and coast, extract speed versus time plot, which is what this is. If you, if you differentiate this, you will get uh, your acceleration at each point, divide that by mass, you get uh, the, I mean, no, so yeah, you get the deceleration at each point, uh, multiply that by the mass of your vehicle and you'll get how much uh, uh, force is acting. Okay, then you have mechanical and inertial forces, which either you can neglect or you can take from calculations. Subtract those forces from each point and you get the uh, the the, uh, the real life uh, aerodynamic drag values at each velocity. Compare that with your CFD. It's another way to validate how your forces are. I'm sorry, I'm going fast in this. Feel free to pause this. It's, it's quite self-explanatory. That's why I've typed it out over here. Um, it's a little bit about objective testing. And the last one, of course, run circuit tests. Autocross tests, obtain DAQ. Obtain a good aero balance and then optimize your spring and damper setups. Run endurance tests, obtain DAC data, and you can calculate fuel consumption and energy losses. Again, you validate that with your lap sim, uh, not necessarily with optimum lap uh, because that is, that is quite basic. Uh, validate it with whatever MATLAB or simulating models you make, and that'll give you a good uh, validation over here. Um, so that's a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, observe timing sheets from the past. Okay, start looking at them. 
run complete simulations of your vehicle, obtain lap times and scores, and you know get those scores from before. Determine baseline theoretical point score for last year. Okay, that's the first thing you need to do. Test your previous wheels vehicle for all four events. Do it somewhere in your test track or in a campus wherever you do it. Uh, compare your real lap times with the previous year's results. Okay, so once you have these two, you can determine the approximate error in your value. So this is based on lap sim. So you get a certain point score. Do real life testing, you get a certain point score with your old vehicle. That gives you an error that you can apply in the future. So if if I if I calculate I'll get if I calculate I'll get nine hundred points here I'll actually only get eight hundred points. It's not true because you can't get that many in dynamics. But just an example. Then run a full car simulation. Uh, obtain theoretical lap times. Do this with your theoretical design. Okay. Theoretical lap times. Apply simulation error that you got here, and you can actually calculate the potential points you'll get in your event in the future. This is one way to use it. It, it's a methodology that I I've just uh, written over here. It's not super accurate. Only use this if you're going with the if you're going with some conceptual kit to the event. Don't use this sort of simulation if you're bringing a real kit. Instead of doing all of this, you'd run a real simulation at the end and determine your points. So this is kind of a way to gauge your performance. Okay. So with that, uh, yeah, you have to keep doing that. Calculate your potential points. All keep optimizing your design parameters. This is one more way to use that optimum. I mean, instead of using only optimum laps, you can also use this method if you are a team that's done aero for multiple years. Once you do all of this, you'll hit a certain wall, uh, and and then you won't be able to go any further in your simulation. And then you can finalize your design choices. Um, again, feel free to pause this. It has a lot of information which you can figure out. So at the end, these are all the things we've covered today. Is it a horsepower hog? Definitely, <laughs> you're not gonna get. Uh, it's it's always gonna be a horsepower hog uh, unless you you somehow design it without horsepower losses. Um, you're always gonna get drag unless you're running an electric vehicle on the moon. So. Or, or you're uh, you're going in uh, some sort of vacuum tube like a hyperloop. So you're always going to have horsepower losses. Be ready to compromise the right way. Is it a speed hack? Yeah, definitely. If you use it the right way, it is. So make sure to use it the right way. Um, is it a, is an aero package worth it? Well, I'm giving you my two cents. Uh, it's up to you to decide now. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope this was informative for for newer teams and also for for teams who are well experienced. I hope you've learned something new, and if nothing, I hope this was at least entertaining. Uh, and I'm open to questions. These are links that you can check out, or these are resources you can check out. Uh, with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. Saidat, huge round of applause. Uh, I mean, you should get an award for finishing everything from fluid dynamics all the way to validation in 83 minutes. Uh, that takes something to cover the whole basic chapter of aerodynamics down for formula student together in such a short time. Uh, and yeah. yes, as you mentioned, luckily this is live and it is recorded. So yeah. uh, in, in case anyone wants to uh, slow down and see the slides, you can. Uh, and that was the beauty of doing it live and having it on YouTube as well. Um, so Saidat, we do have a few questions from some of our uh, participants. Uh, I've yeah, shared it on the on. sheet with you. Um, so whenever you're ready, we can we can go yeah. over it. Yeah, I'm just uh, and, opening that up. <clears throat> sure. And uh, just if you if just a note, if you can read out the entire question uh, before answering it, this would help capture the question in this is in the video recording as well. Definitely, definitely, sure. Um, yeah, so the first question, does an aero package have effects on understeer, oversteer behavior of the car? Yeah, uh, definitely, like uh, I uh, mentioned in the in the presentation, uh, based on the sort of vertical loads you're adding to your car, um, you have a certain effect on the maximum lateral load. Um, ex excluding all aero sensitive, excluding tire load sensitivities, um, which I think maybe you can to start off with, um, definitely it has the effect. So in, in simple terms, Again, I'm just saying in simple terms, rearwards arrow generally helps you get understeer um, and frontwards arrow doesn't, it gives you oversteer. However, if you're really using arrow to set up, uh, you know, people do say, I, I've seen a lot of videos and uh, examples saying you need to set up the camber too and all of those, definitely important. But after that, I would personally set up my uh, ride heights and arrow first before moving on to mechanical because everything else is kind of a tweak to the arrow map. Uh, set up your ride heights and arrow, uh, ride heights and your wing angles first, and then go on to other things to optimize. Because arrow is more sensitive to all this than mechanical loads. So yeah, uh, definitely it has an effect. Um, if we attach an unsprung arrow package, will it increase compliances? Um, 
it's it's it, there's no straight answer to it let's look at it first with the with the sprung kit if you put a sprung kit you're going to have a lot more elastic load transfers which basically means if you don't have enough stiffness you need to add extra components you know if you don't have enough elastic stiffness you have to add an extra roll bar or or if you don't have uh, if you have a roll bar you might need to make a heavier one to make it stiffer so if you have a sprung yes it could lead to more compliances unsprung uh, more it i don't think it has too many compliance issues what is worse is uh, if you if you'll have to mount it to something like your uh, upright okay don't put it on your suspension necessarily uh, if you want you can i don't i'm not the best person to answer that uh, but uh, if if you put it on the upright which a lot of people do um, it won't increase compliances but it will flex certain things so if you mount your underbody to the uh, upright it will it will start flexing if you have too much bump okay? if you, if you hit a bump especially if in germany uh, fsg there is a corner that has a, I, i forgot the exact name but i know there is one corner on the track that uh, that uh, kills most suspension it's, it it breaks a lot of suspensions a lot of uh, wishbone so if you hit something like that with an unsprung kit uh, make sure at least if you're putting a kit at least have some sort of damper system again it's it's uh, it it uh, causes more uh, harm than in sprung but only if you do it wrong if you can mount it perfectly i think you can do an unsprung kit without uh, without compliance so i hope that answers that um if if a car is rear cg bias and i add a rear wing the increase in vertical load in rear tire will result in reaching the grip window before the front tire and eventually it will oversteer more right uh, if you yeah so see if you if you have a car that's rear cg biased without the wing that is correct because you need more lateral loads at the rear to balance the front and ultimately your rear tires will saturate but if you add a rear wing that increases the limit of the lateral load then you can actually have a neutral balanced car um so yeah no i don't think uh, increasing vertical rear load if you're only increasing virtual load in the form of aerodynamic downforce if you're not adding inertial load that will affect the lateral dynamics of the car then yeah you can actually get a neutral uh, neutral steer because you have a mechanically oversteering car and you add rear wing load so you actually get a, a, an understeering aero car which balances out the car it's not as simple as this there's so many more calculations but generally yes um you can stop oversteering by adding more rear wing could you go a little in depth in your path to get into oxford brooks for your masters um okay i'll get to that one at the end we'll discover the other uh, questions um how to find aero balance from cfd results um yeah so from your cfd results if you can get uh, if you can do those full car simulations i told and get your aero map uh, and then validate that with real life with your potentiometers uh, potentiometers generally if you Uh, uh connect them parallel to the uh your dampers or or your springs um, that will give you how much elastic load transfer or uh, deflection due to elastic load transfer and you can back calculate um, so with that data you'll know how much your cfd is wrong in terms of uh, aero balance uh but to get aero balance for uh, with only cfd see with cfd you can get your center of pressure and you can use that with your vehicle dynamics team to understand your your load balances but uh, that yeah you can do it your question the answer essence of your uh, the answer to your question is essentially yes but it's not good enough you need to do validation to support that we want to introduce aero kits in our car first should be introduce front wings or rear wings um i would suggest the first thing you start focusing on is uh, optimizing your current nose cone side pods and a basic diffuser design to start with uh, because a diffuser is kind of safe to play with uh, it might be a little heavy if you don't use you know you can use a good uh, core maybe a foam core or even balsa wood uh, but uh, you know poly polystyrene polyurethane or balsa wood core uh, but i think diffuser is a safe thing to play with because you're not going to add too much harm to your car in terms of throwing it off balance at the same time it will help you understand how to run the car uh, with an aero kit maybe you can play around with differential pressure sensors learn how to do cfd mapping uh, so yeah it's neither it's not front or rear wing i would personally start off with a good underbody diffuser design if you're adding wings try to add both of them because you need the front wing for downforce and the rear wing for balancing the car so yeah uh, start with the underbodies and stuff and slowly make your way to both front and rear wings don't put only one wing alone it's it's risky Uh, please elaborate the post processing and please explain how we can take decisions based on the cl cd graph um so in terms of post processing see i i had shown uh, obviously the streamlines that's one thing you can do i mean i think uh, in terms of you know cfd post processing i believe uh, 
Rajat had done a, a good uh, session on CFD a few weeks back. I would suggest you you do you check that out. It's really good. Uh, but just in terms of you know what you can use for validation, um, yeah. So what you do is obviously create the arrow map from CFD uh, because you'll have those COP positions and all of that. Um, underbody pressure contours. Get these and get the bodywork surface uh, streamlines because number three you can do that by using a uh, uh, flow viz paint that I'd shown. That gives you good a good idea of how these streamlines go around. Underbody pressure contours, get that as well because that'll help you in CFD mapping for uh, for your uh, for the rest of the car. And then of course the aero map. Uh, I hope that helps you in terms of understanding validation. These are just kind of fancy things. They're good for you to understand, but don't show these to a judge unless you can explain what they are because uh, they look all cool. Okay, CFD is very fancy, glamorous, and all that, but there's deeper meaning to it, especially in the vorticity plot. Extremely important for understanding induced track. These will help you uh, with your flow tufts. I don't think there's any way to really get these in real life unless you use like a like a smoke or something. Um, this one you can definitely get from CFD and it helps you with validation. Uh, and see, these are the four things that I recommend. I don't want to get too much into detail for CFD because uh, uh, I, there is a, there are other sessions that were really good for that. But feel free to go through those slides. I think those will be the most helpful with the validation techniques that you have. Um, yeah, and then. Uh, the next question, does the position of mounting points of aero devices change aero balance? Um, yes and no. I mean, see, if, if you mount it, let's say if you're, if you're using a rear wing, what you would ideally want to do um, will be to uh, place the, so suppose you're vertically mounting it. Uh, if you're vertically mounting it with two rods, make sure that that, that is positioned somewhere at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the aerodynamic center of, of, of the effective wing set um, because that will minimize the amount of pitching forces you have. Uh, and if you want to stabilize it, of course, use like a swan neck or something uh, very useful. But in terms of, uh, you know, mounting points, changing your aero balance, I don't think so because ultimately the load will go through the connection point onto your chassis, similar to, similar to suspension. Uh, only downside is if you mount it at an angle, then you're also going to have an extra moment that's created that will add to your car. Um, so yeah, maybe in a way, yes, it can affect your aero balance. Uh, I would, I would suggest keep your mounts as, uh, as linear as possible. Uh, because you don't really need to worry about something like a roll center and all that. It's not like a suspension where you need a, you know, you need a double A-arm suspension and you have to worry about those roll centers. The wing itself, I would as I would just recommend mount it as uh, linear as possible. Mount it in the direction of the downforce and, and drag uh, and minimize bending forces on the rod. Again, yeah, so it, it, it can and can't affect balance. I would say it wouldn't affect it too much if you're within certain limits, but I, I would recommend mounting it as stable as possible. Um, again, I think a better person to answer this would be someone who's more, who's more experienced in chassis loads and um, things like that. Of course, no doubt I, I should as an aerodynamicist know it. This is what I know, but if you want uh, more detailed FEA explanations, uh, you know, it would be better to ask someone else who's experienced in that. Long story short, yes, it can slightly affect your aero balance. <clears throat> Uh, we are utilizing fans for generating downforce. Yes, it is legal. Okay. Uh, how do you create a plausible CFD model to analyze it? Also, how can we validate it? Mm, okay. Um, same, see, plausible CFD model, if you can integrate them. Uh, so, so for this, I would suggest doing a transient simulation if you're looking at something like a, like a rate, like a, you're using a fan as, as some sort of a blown uh, diffuser effect, if, if just as an example. Um, I would uh, say, yeah, do a transient simulation, get your meshing right. Very ambitious what you're trying to do, but I think it's uh, it's really cool if you can get that working. How would you validate it? Um, in the same way that you would validate flow into your radiator, um, you know, there are certain devices that can be used. Uh, I don't want to give too many details in that because you know currently the event is still going on. So uh, you know we, we maybe talk about that in like a design review or something. Uh, but how can you validate it? I would say use differential pressure sensors wherever you can because those are probably your best bet right now. Uh, try using pitot tubes along uh, the surface of your car. Um, I know I know at uh, uh, Brooks at OBR uh, we, we've done that. I've seen that on the car as well. Um, so yeah yeah try try pitot tubes. Those are those are good uh, good validation techniques. Many teams use that. Uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of your CFD, try using transient simulation. I might be wrong here, but I would personally use a transient simulation because uh, these things are accelerate flow from, from with an external source of energy. Uh, so you're, you're dealing with a surge of velocity out of nowhere. Um, so I, I would do a transient sim. 
Shaitit, uh, do you yeah. have time for the last two? Because uh, yeah. These yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. I'm, I'm, yeah? I'm, I'm okay, uh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, please share the validation reports. You would look for evaluate if evaluating an arrow kits effectiveness. Um, okay, I can't answer this like up to point because again, I've uh, we have an event going on right now and. You know, uh, I think tomorrow is the last day for design event. So yeah, maybe yeah. after all the finals and everything are done, we can probably go through that in details. But validation reports you would look at. I mean, I've given you a general gist of some of the things you could do uh, in terms of testing and validation. So feel free to look at what I've shown in the slides. But I, unfortunately, man, I can't uh, I can't tell you any details right now until the event is over. Um, can you elaborate on nose design for aerodynamics? Um, yeah, I I would say just. Make sure the in, inlet flow is smooth. Um, you send it properly to the to the underbody, and I know it's difficult with FSA because you have limits for how long your nose can, you know, how long it can extend, and also I think for how long you can extend. And uh, you also, if you're using a standard impact attenuator, that that I'm telling you that is probably the most annoying thing or the most difficult thing to work around because it's just this big uh, like triangular thing that's sticking out, and it, and you have to shape your nose around that. Uh, but as a, as a fundamental thumb rule, I would say, you know, angle the bottom of your nose downwards. Don't try to put a flat nose and and, and then the flat under, under underneath, you know, like a, like a flat, uh, like a corner. Uh, try to angle it into like an inlet diffuser kind of to just ease the flow underneath the car. Um, also, if you're only putting nose, a nose cone, you can actually try putting slight winglets and stuff on the nose. Um, you know, kind of like what you see in the camera mounts in F1, because uh, I mean, it's a good way for you to start playing around with aero because that won't give you too much downforce at the speeds you're running, but it'll help you start uh, developing ways to optimize your flow into your radiators, which more often than not are kept in the side pods of your of, of FSA cars. Um, so yeah, uh, I think, yeah, firstly, you know, get a good inlet design for the underneath of the underside of the nose. I think the top of the nose, if you're not focusing too much on performance, just make it look good. I, I know it's not the right way to do it, but yeah, make a make a good looking nose cone for the car clean. Um, and that helps you get a better surface finish. Don't make it too complicated. Make a simple nose cone so that you can focus on surface finish because that uh, reduces the skin drag. Play around with these little winglets that you can fix on the, on the, uh, on the nose cone. It's a good way to uh, understand how flow goes to your side pods and it'll better gear you up when you're trying to get into a full arrow. But uh, Assuming you're asking this, if you already have a full arrow kit, um, do simulations with the front wing. That's all I can say. Uh, the same as the previous advice, but run your front wing simulations with the nose and the rotating tires. Um, so that's that. And uh, if there are no more questions there, I'll get back to that final question. Uh, could you go a little in depth on your path to get into Oxford Groups for the Masters? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I applied in like December of my fourth year and... Uh, then I got the call letter in like January. Uh, quite a simple procedure. Uh, I think you need to go to something called a UK Pass website or something, or UC uh, UCAS. I think UCAS. Uh, anyhow, yeah, it's pretty straightforward application, just like any other university. Um, it's it's not like you need some big fancy experience, a founder student experience. It's more about your uh, willpower to learn and your your interest, um, and 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 what exactly you want to learn in it. You know, don't just do a MSc in motorsport engineering because it says motorsport engineering. Okay, have an idea of what you want to learn from it. Personally, for me, I worked a lot on aero. You know, I worked on aero. I was a driver for the team. Then I did some business plan. I was a team lead at the end. And it, it was a wholesome experience. But what I was really passionate about at the end was doing race engineering. And and, and uh, that's kind of what I want to do. And that's kind of what I am doing right now. Uh, I'm a race engineer in esports. So, uh uh, yeah, so I, I thought, you know, what better degree than to do something related to that. Uh, and I wasn't that great in vehicle dynamics. I'm not going to lie. So doing that course actually helped me a lot in, uh, in learning that, understanding it. Uh, and I don't think that that's the perfect, the only way you can do it. Uh, there are so many other good universities, but personally, my experience with Brooks was, was great. Um, I learned a lot over there. Uh, my thesis was based on lab sim race engineering Uh my uh, my project guide, uh, uh, Mr. Sergio Rinland, was was very great. He uh, he's he's, he's ex Formula One, so he really helped me in understanding things. Uh, you know, got got to interact with a lot of uh, great people who have who worked in the industry for so many years. So if that's something that uh, that uh, that will help you a lot, if you're interested in that, go ahead. Uh, don't do an, don't do that degree thinking you'll get into F1. It's not that straightforward. Okay, uh, don't think if you do motorsport you're going to get into F1, but. Uh, 
in that the path to get into oxford books just apply uh, more often than not if if you have the right skill set background you can get in uh, but it's a great experience i would uh, never have taken any second decision i think that was that was that was an awesome experience and i loved it and it's it's it was great it was a good payout for that payoff um but yeah that uh, that is uh, that's the end of that the my brooks experience so feel free to uh, message me on linkedin if you have any other doubts and i know i've got a lot of questions that's where i was myself, right? yeah. that's where i'm going to go to next uh, amog who asked you the question about the validation reports asked uh, when if you could share a way to contact you after the competition uh, and uh, i guess you answered that already uh, via yeah. maybe linkedin or perhaps they could write to us and we can forward the email to you as well and then you can connect with them directly whichever way works right sure anything anything works yeah great um so that ends today's session uh, saidu thank you for your time you not only shared such a valuable information on how to get started with aerodynamics and including how to get to the validation part but also you shared your journey um as a race engineer and your passion for it and it really showed and i'm sure the team the participants that are here have are, have uh, learned a lot and also take taken away a lot uh, so thank you again you have a wonderful evening and we hope to have many future sessions with you as well thank you thank you so much kathy thank you you have a great evening sider yeah you too